In this episode of Motive Garage presented by Spares Box, we take our GR Yaris to the dyno to see if it can be the most powerful one in the world. Now, if you watched our last video on the GR Yaris, you know that we installed a Golby's Parts G25 550 Turbo Kit. Now, once that was on, I was able to drive the car, but I didn't want to go crazy with it and show a road test, because I wanted to get it tuned first and make sure everything was all good. But my initial drive was that obviously, larger turbo means we've lost a little bit of low down power, but honestly, the power curve was still where we needed it to be, and it drove pretty good. More than anything, I was just excited to get it on the dyno and see what happened. So, off to Power Tune Australia we go to let the boys work their magic on the Motec. So the car come to us after Andrew and Grub fitted the turbo kit to the car. So he also asked us to upgrade the injectors as well. We were able to change the injector scaling literally from a drop down menu in the Motec, put the car on the dyno and run it. No changes to ignition timing, no changes to absolutely anything at all. Literally bolt it on the dyno, change the injector scaling and run the car. So there are a couple of other changes that we did need to make in order to control the boost correctly. So from factory, these cars with a, come with a normally open valve. Now what that means is that basically the wastegate is always open and you need vacuum to actually close that valve. Now we've moved to a standard MAC valve or a, a, with a TurboSmart um, wastegate that's normally closed. That means that we've got, say for example, a 16 pound spring behind the gate and the gate is always closed and will make 16 pounds of boost if we have no boost control at all. Where the factory one, it won't make any boost at all. So prior to bringing the car in, Andrew asked me what size spring we should probably put into the car. Um, I suggested somewhere around about 20 pounds um, with a three port solenoid. Typically you can double that boost. So if we put a 19 pound spring in, we could see pretty close to about 40 pounds as our maximum boost with a three port. Now, when the car come in, we run it up on wastegate pressure to see where, so the car runs up, and it ran up with a wastegate pressure of around 16 pound or 16 and a half pound. Now, that's quite typical because there are a lot of things that go on inside the engine that, that contribute to that spring pressure, um, such as exhaust back pressure and other bits and pieces. So you can find that the wastegate will open at a slightly lower pressure than your exact spring pressure. First of all, let's take a have a look at the dyno. And what I'm gonna show you is when we actually matched up the power with what we were previously making. So with the old setup, we were targeting around sort of 28 pounds of boost. We were seeing it spike to 28 and it would fall back to sort of 27, 26, thereabouts up top. Now, previously we made 252 kilowatts. Now, what you will notice from the, the graphs that are in front of me at the moment is that with the new setup, the turbo is much lazier. Now, the reason being is obviously, you know, larger compressor, larger turbine, all those types of things. Um, and we see power come on a lot later. Um, now, it, in the, this example, we're making the exact same power with effectively four pounds less boost. When we actually talk about this, this turbo setup versus our stock turbo setup, and when we're looking at it on the dyno, the results are kind of skewed. The reason being is that with the dyno, we're able to load the car fairly heavily before we actually start our run. Now with the existing turbo, we are actually able to make 20 pounds before the run even began, which means that you don't see the boost go from nothing um, and work up to its 21 pounds. We just see 21 pounds all the way across. With the new turbo though, we're able to achieve about sort of five pounds loading it up on the dyno at the same point with the same ramp rate and everything else. And effectively, you'll, you can then see that this boost curve works up from sort of zero or five pounds up to the target of 24 pounds. So as you can see here, uh, we've got zero at the start of the run and we make our peak boost at around about, I think it's 4,500 RPM. So if we look here through the graph, um, what we can see is that, let's say for example, at five and a half grand, uh, we're about six pounds different boost wise um, and power wise around about 10 kilowatts or pretty close to. If we move further to the right hand side of the graph and we come up to about say 6,000, we're about six pounds of boost difference. And over here, we're looking at around about, you know, another 10 kilowatts or thereabouts. 
As the RPM increases though, we actually see that the existing boost curve actually starts to fall off boost and we're now down to around about five pounds of boost and our power figures are now starting to match up. So typically it's about five pounds is the difference between the two turbos to make the same power. Now, that's quite typical of this setup purely because of the size of the turbo. So looking at this graph, and if we were running this boost setup, the car would be slower. Okay, we're making the same peak power, but earlier on, the other turbo was much more, you know, it made more power, it was better to drive. Now, that's why we can't really compare dyno sheets when Joe Bloggs turbo makes 250 kilowatts and someone else's turbo makes 250 kilowatts. They may be totally different in the, in the cur curve or area under the curve. If we take this particular setup and we apply the same boost pressure as we, you know, if, if we say 28 pounds on the new turbo and 28 pounds on the old turbo, we end up with a much different result. Our new turbo away, and I give you the same sort of boost pressure, which you can see here we're making very, very close to the same boost pressure. You can see we're now making 40 kilowatts more power. Now, again, as you can see here, it's, it's much later, which is to be expected. This isn't really able to be recovered just yet. Camshafts, housing changes and things like that may actually, you know, we might be able to move this curve further to the left. But at the moment, peak power is where we kind of want it to be, right up the top, away from the areas where you may hurt the engine as it comes on to boost. So in this particular example, we're trying to sort of really control this torque through this, this section here. And that's why you might see this sort of dip in the power curve. That's so that we don't ramp the torque on and potentially lift the head or cause damage to the engine. Remembering that this engine is literally unopened other than valve springs. So again, on that, on that uh, where we talk about peak torque and braking engines and things like that, when we've put this new turbocharger onto the car and we've, we've sort of had a look at the existing power curve and we've looked at where the torque was made in the, you know, with the old turbo setup and what the factory was doing with the torque, we try and match a, a very similar sort of a, you know, torque curve, but albeit a bit later in the rev range. So the later in the rev range that you make peak torque, the easier that it is going to be on the engine. If we were to make the, you know, say 500 Newton meters and we made it at 2000 RPM, you're probably gonna lift the head off the engine. Um, if you do that same, that same torque number and you move it further back and we say at five and a half thousand RPM, it's much easier on the engine and the components within it. As with, you know, most uh, fault finding and, and dyno tuning for the first time on a new platform, you're going to encounter different things. As you would, would remember from our previous videos, we encountered valve float pretty early on. Um, we've now encountered our next mechanical limitation with the engine. Now, the limitation at this point in time is actually the fuel pump. So the in-tank fuel pump, not the high pressure one, but the in-tank one. What we found is that when we, we started to make, you know, power levels of around, you know, 270, 280 kilowatts, the, the factory in-tank fuel pump was unable to keep up with that fuel demand and we're actually seeing the pressure drop. So effectively, the safest point on your factory fuel pump is going to be around about 260 kilowatts, 265 maybe on A85 fuel. Um, and at that level, you'll be able to drive the car all the time, no problems, and, and go through the gears. Now, we were able to stretch, um, shall we say, the, the fuel pump uh, for the purposes of our testing you know, today. Um, and what we've done is, we've done a couple of little tricks, and that is we've reduced the ethanol content in the car. That's the first thing. So by reducing the ethanol content down to around about E60, we still maintain the knock resistance within the fuel. So we can still put the same amount of timing as we do with the 85. So we were actually able to stretch that fuel pump um, once we put it onto E60. And then we found our next mechanical limit. So our next mechanical limit is the map sensor. So effectively, the factory map sensor reads up to about 32 pounds of boost. Very, very close, 31 and a half thereabouts. And once you reach that point, you need to change the map sensor. There's some other tricks that we can do. Um, and we sort of were able to work around that just for tonight. And we were able to put a bit more boost in the car. We actually targeted 32 pounds, 33 pounds in, in the end. We actually ended up at 34. So that's where I want to show you the power that you can make in your Yaris with the turbo kit that we've had put on the car. If you, you have a look at the ECU, you'll see it's written in capital letters, do not use this map in capital letters for good reason. So if we have a look at the power figure, our final number, 321 kilowatts.
all of that power out of a 1.6 litre, three cylinder Toyota Yaris with a completely unopened engine other than valve springs. So looking at this new power curve, as you can see, it's still got the torque management going on here through the through the sort of the peak area. So we haven't sort of really come up and then held it flat. It's sort of you know, lent over, so to speak. And if we have a look at our boost and our torque graphs, you'll see that they're not drastically different than what you've actually seen in the, the previous runs. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, well, the boost increase wasn't massive, but why the big power increase? Now, what happens is with this particular turbocharger is we're starting to move right into its sweet spot of efficiency. Now, with the 1.6 liter engine, the G25 550, with the rear housing that's on the, on the turbo at the moment, we're finding that it's really happy around sort of 34, 35 or potentially more boost. Now, obviously we haven't pushed it there because there's you know, a number of safety factors that we need to address before we go there, um, but it's really starting to wake up. So effectively, we add two pounds of boost and we see a large power increase purely because the turbo is more efficient. So you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, this is crazy. The fact that the car's made, you know, 430 horsepower, unopened and it's probably gonna break. That's what you're probably thinking. However, we've got a number of different systems in the car, things like oil pressure, oil temperature, inlet air temperature, we've got coolant pressure, we've got coolant temperature, we've got boost pressure, we've got sensors pretty much all around the car that are able to give us feedback as we're performing you know, a dyno run. Now, typically, when you start to find the limits of engines, you'll find some things like you might pressurize the cooling system maybe start to lift the head a little bit. At that point, you know, okay, cool, we've reached the point of, you know, maximum torque um, or, or, you know, cylinder pressure. Uh, when we're now starting to, to push the mechanical limits of the engine. At this point, one of the most impressive things is that this car is not giving us any signs that there's a problem or potentially a problem coming up. That means that there's no coolant pressure. There's no drop in oil pressure. We don't have any other mechanical signs, like no knock levels coming up, you know, general engine noise, all those types of things. It's literally happy making this power at the moment. Now that's not to say that we make 435 horsepower and the thing snaps a rod in half, because those types of things you can't foresee. However, at this point in time, as far as the, the surrounding parts of the engine, there is no evidence that this engine's going to give up on us anytime soon. Effectively, like I mentioned, at this point in time, the safe level with this current mechanical setup is about 260 kilowatts. What's gonna happen is we need to replace the low pressure fuel pump in the car. We need to replace the map sensor with a larger item. And potentially we need to look at colder spark plugs and maybe an upgraded coil. So we're finding that at this point, we're, we're just touching on the edge of some, some spark problems. Um, however, it's, it's not known just yet whether it's, it's plug or coil. Um, but, you know, hey, why not just replace them both? So it's pretty exciting to have made 430 horsepower in this car. I mean, it's not very often you get excited over a Yaris. I mean, we deal with 1,000 plus horsepower GDRs nearly every day, you know, 500 plus kilowatt Evos, and we're talking about a 320 kilowatt Yaris and being like, this is amazing. But it really is, it's, you know, this is potentially a new platform for people that, you know, may really want to make some serious power in these cars. I mean, at the end of the day, it's four wheel drive. Um, you know, it's, it's small, it's light. So it's a pretty good platform to try and, you know, go pretty quick in. Again, this is super, super, super impressive. I mean, if you told me that, you know, you had a Yaris that made 320 kilowatts when, you know, people start, started first modifying Yaris's, I'd probably call you a dreamer. But here's the evidence, we've done it. Well, same as Ryan, I am mega impressed with the power that our GR Yaris is able to make. I can't wait to drive the thing in anger, to be brutally honest, but I need to wait until we install a larger fuel pump and replace the map sensor on the car so that we can make that tune safe to drive all of the time. Uh, what we did on the dyno was perfectly safe. There was nothing wrong with the air fuel ratios or how it was tuned. It's just that we need the safety parameters back for fuel pressure and the map sensor before we can actually race the car in anger. Now we have drag radials, rear LSD and a clutch. So we're pretty pumped to hit the drag strip once it opens again so we can become the world's quickest GR Yaris down the quarter mile. Uh, the next question is though, are we the most powerful GR Yaris in the world right now? Well, my personal opinion is probably, maybe, 
but it really depends on which dyno you believe. As we've done in a previous dyno tech video, inertia dyno versus retarder dyno, and then calculated engine horsepower, calculated engine BHP or PS, etc., means that it's very hard to compare between dynos. But as far as I'm concerned, I reckon we probably do have the most powerful Yaris in the world right now. Probably won't last for long. There's plenty of people working on them and we're enjoying the healthy competition. So, uh, game on. Make sure you subscribe and see what we can do with our GR Yaris in the future.